Good evening. My name is Brooke Locklear, and today I will be talking about gastrointestinal helmets of three feral cat populations. A good bit of research has already been conducted on pathogenic microorganisms that are carried and transmitted by domestic house cats. A majority of this research focused on bacteria, mites, helmets, fungi, and protozoans. As many of you know, some of these microorganisms can cause various diseases, which result in a wide variety of serious medical issues. Although far more research has been conducted on domestic house cats rather than their feral counterparts, some analysis of gastrointestinal parasites in feral cat populations has been conducted in various parts of the world, such as the northern region of the Nail Delta, northern Iran, Spain, and Rio de Janeiro. Each of these studies' results show that the overall prevalence for the gastrointestinal helmets in feral cat populations was at or over 90%. Because of studies like these and many others, it is well known that the presence of intestinal parasites is much higher in the feral cats than in domestic cats. This is due in part to the fact that most feral cats are not kept on a deworming schedule like a good bit of the domestic cats are. It is hypothesized that the feral cats in the three populations will be infected with potentially pathogenic parasites. So this experiment was conducted to shed light on the pathogenic microorganisms that the feral cats have, as well as provide a recommended and proper course of action to help treat the cats in order to help them achieve a better quality of life. The three main parts of our procedure process in this research was the collection, testing, and analysis. These three parts will be talked about in more depth in the following slides. During this research, over 70 samples were collected from three separate locations. The Founders Hole location was considered developed and had the highest population of cats. The cat colony was considered forested and the Andrews area was considered rural and had the lowest population of cats. Some samples were collected by setting out litter boxes filled with clay cat litter in areas that had high concentrations of cats, and these litter boxes were checked and cleaned once a week. However, other samples were collected by searching the grounds around areas of high feral cat density. A lot of safety precautions were taken throughout the collection process, and these included avoiding any contact with feral cats while collecting samples. Obviously, wearing appropriate clothing, which involved long sleeve shirts, long pants, and closed toed shoes. Goggles were worn, and so were disposable gloves. Proper hand sanitation techniques were employed immediately after sample collection, and this included washing hands with soap and running water and using an alcohol based hand sanitizer. Once the samples were collected, they were then frozen until they could be analyzed at a later time. In order to test these samples, the fecal float method was used because that is the method most used by veterinarians. We began with 2 grams of the fecal sample and that was put in a new unused fecal float container. The fecal soil solution was then poured into the container until it was about halfway full. And then the inner tube of the container was then twisted into it to thoroughly mix the fecal sample with the fecal soil solution. More fecosol solution was then added by pipette to create a meniscus at the top of the cylindrical container. And then a microscope cover slip was then placed on top of the container. These microscope slips were then let to sit on top of the container for five minutes. And then the cover slip was placed onto a microscope slide. The picture above shows a uh, array of the samples being tested for, during the fecal float method with the cover slips on top as they were waiting. And then the bottom picture below shows what the microscope size looked like once the cover slip was placed on them after the fecal float method was deployed. Once the microscope size were prepared, they were then observed through binocular compound light microscope at 400 and 400 times magnification. All of the slides were examined for parasites by using the back and forth scanning method that most veterinarians use. The parasites found in each sample were identified by referring to a veterinary textbook of parasitology, and the parasites were cataloged, recorded by genus name, and photographed for presentation purposes. 
After careful consideration, prevalence and intensity was chosen as the analysis used for this research because it was most commonly used in previous parasitology research that mimicked this experiment. So prevalence is considered the proportion of infected individuals within a population at a certain time, whereas intensity is how an infected an individual is. For each parasite, prevalence was calculated by dividing the number of parasitized samples by the total number of samples and then multiplying that number by 100. For each parasite, the intensity was calculated by dividing the total number of parasites by the number of samples. The mean intensity was then compared for each parasite among the three populations by using one-way ANOVA, two key post hoc tests, and a descriptive analysis. The four main parts of the results for this research include the observation, the prevalence calculation, the intensity calculation, and the recommended treatment plan. In the picture above, you can see a whipworm as seen at 100 magnifications during the slide observation. In the picture below, you can see the whipworm egg as seen as 400 magnification during the slide observation. In the picture above, you can see a hookworm at 400 magnification as seen during the slide observation. On the below picture, you can see a cluster of these worms as seen at 100 magnification on slide observation. As it is clear to see, this sample in particular had a very high density of these worms. On this picture here, you can see a longworm as observed at 400 magnification during the slide observation. In this picture above, you can see a roundworm as seen at 100 magnification during the slide observation. And in the picture below, you can see the eggs of the roundworm as seen at 400 magnification during the slide observation. In this picture here, you can see two demodex mites as seen during slide observations at 400 magnification. In this picture here, you can see an ear mite as seen at 400 magnification during slide observation. This slide shows the prevalence of parasites observed in three feral cat populations. Most notable is the 100% prevalence of whipworm and lungworm found at the Founders Hall location. The highest prevalence for both the cat colony and the Andrews location was the roundworm. Also notable is that no demodex or ear mites were found in the Andrews colony. Graphical representation of the prevalence of gastrointestinal parasites infection in the feral cats among the three populations. As you can see once again, the 100% prevalence rate among the lungworms and the whipworms at the Founders Hall location. Founders Hall typically had a higher prevalence except for in the roundworms. Also notable again is that there was no demodex or ear mites found at the Andrews. Here we have the mean intensity of gastrointestinal parasites among the three feral cat populations. As you can see, only three gastrointestinal parasites were found to have significant difference among the three populations. These include the whipworms, lungworms, and demodex. As you can see in the whipworm graph, the Founders Hall and the Andrews location has significantly different mean intensities. Here in the hookworm graph, you can see that none of the three locations had significantly different mean intensities. Here in the lungworm graph, you can see that both the cat colony and the Andrews location was significantly different from the Founders Hall location in terms of mean intensity. Here in the roundworm graph, you can see that the three locations did not have any significant difference in terms of mean intensity. Here in the Demodex chart, you can see that Founders Hall was significantly different from the Andrews location. Here in the ear mite graph, it is clear to see that there was no significant difference among any of the locations. During this project, we worked very closely with veterinarians to figure out a recommended treatment plan for the feral cats. 
This treatment plan was broken down by what medication, dosage, and duration was needed for each parasite. For treatment of the whipworms, it was recommended that they begin a fendibinazole at 500 milligrams per kilogram for three days. For the hookworms, it was also recommended fenobenazole at the same dosage and duration, as well as parental at 10 milligrams per pound for three days. For longworms, it was recommended that prezequintil be given at every eight hours for three days at a dosage of 23 milligrams. For the treatment of roundworms, it was recommended that they be given the same thing as for the hookworms, which is fenobenazole and parental, at their recommended dosage for three days. For the treatment of demodex, it was recommended that they can be given either or of these medications listed. However, ivermectin is probably the most used, and that dosage is 300 to 400 mcs per kilogram, and that's one time a week for three weeks. For the ear mites, it was recommended that the feral cats be given medicated baths, lime sulfur rinses, and that their hair be clipped. And that's on an as-needed basis, but bi-weekly. Future research for this project could be done after the recommended treatment had been administered and they were given a one-week wait period for all the treatment to take effect. The retesting would need to be done in the same way as this research was conducted in order to ensure valid results. And then the recalculation of prevalence and intensity also needs to be repeated in a similar fashion. Here's the bibliography for this research, which as you see is continued here.